Hi, thank you so much for joining us for the Fundamental Estate Planning Documents. We are gonna be talking today about the essential documents that make up any basic estate plan. I'm Caitlin McAndrews. I am a partner here at McAndrews, Mihalik, Connolly, Hulse, and Ryan. And I'm gonna be talking about these major documents that you should consider when thinking about making an estate plan. I begin with a quote that is commonly attributed to Ben Franklin, if you fail to plan, you are planning to fail. And we like to think about this in making the estate plan because nobody wants to think about when they're gone, but it is an important consideration to make sure that what you want to have happen happens and that your family um, knows what your will is. So, these are some estate planning documents to consider. We are gonna be focusing today on the will, the financial power of attorney, a healthcare power of attorney, and an advanced medical directive. I'll also briefly speak about revocable trusts and special needs trusts so that you have the basic information to know whether this is something you want to discuss further with your estate planning attorney. As a quick overview, the will is a statement of your will, a statement of what you wish to have happen with your property after you die. It goes through the probate process, which is overseen by the court. And we'll speak more about that in just a moment. A financial power of attorney or a general durable power of attorney names an agent who can make financial and legal decisions for you on your behalf. An agent has to act as they believe you would want um, decisions to be made. They are not acting in their best interest or how they wish to see um, decisions made. Instead, they are stepping into your shoes and making decisions that you that they believe you would make. The same goes for an agent under a healthcare power of attorney, which appoints an agent to make medical decisions for you when you are unable to make and communicate decisions for yourself. And finally, closely related is an advanced medical directive, which states your healthcare wishes when you are in an end of life condition. As I said before, we're gonna briefly trust, touch on revocable trusts, which I'll speak about in the next slide, and also special needs trusts. Special needs trusts are an important part of an estate plan when um, the person making the plan wishes to leave property um, or assets to a loved one with a disability, particularly one who receives SSI and or Medicaid as their insurance. There are several different kinds of special needs trusts and the type that you use depends on where the funds are coming from and how they will be managed. That's beyond the scope of today's presentation, but it is an important concept to be aware of when making an estate plan so that you can speak with your estate planning attorney about um, the, the need for a special needs trust in your own plan. So we'll begin by discussing wills. Wills are the primary document that people think about when they create an estate plan. A will, um, contemplates the property that you have in your name, who you want to leave that property to, and who you want to oversee that process. So the first thing to consider is your assets themselves and whether they're in your own name or if they're jointly titled, such as between you and a spouse. Oftentimes, assets that are titled between you and a spouse will pass without going through probate first. And so they do not have to go through probate. They will go immediately to their surviving spouse. But when that second spouse dies, the will is an important designation of who receives the property next. And since we can't plan our deaths, um, or really there's not, there's very little ability to plan, it's important for both spouses to have a will because we don't know which spouse will die first. You also want to think about how you want to divide your assets. Um, whether or not you're married, you wanna consider who gets your assets after you die. 
Um, and will they be evenly divided? So if you're leaving your assets to your children, are you leaving them evenly between your kids? Or is there a distribution that's um, different based on the needs or circumstances of the family? You, can, you also wanna consider um, what the nature of the assets are and where they're located. Are there any tangible items that you are leaving to loved ones, um, particularly items of value? Um, and there are different ways to plan for those tangible items, um, depending on the value of the items and the importance to the family and whether there's a potential for a contest. You also consider whether any conditions should be placed on the distribution of your assets, particularly regarding age. So if you have very young kids, you may think about whether those assets need to be um, guarded until those kids are over 18, um, graduated from some level of education, holding a job, um, and the circumstances can differ based on the family and the client's desires. And we have conversations about those conditions and then how to include them in the will. You also wanna think about what happens in the event of a disaster. And these are circumstances that are very unlikely to come to fruition but if everyone who you name in your will is gone after you die, what would you like to have happen? In the unlikely event that this occurs, the um, default is for your assets to go to what we call your intestate heirs. And we like to say that everyone dies with a will. If you don't write the will yourself, the state has made one for you. And that is exactly what intestacy is. Each state has their own list of intestate heirs, which is just the state's way of determining who is the closest next of kin. And they go down the line of that list to find the closest relative to leave property to. If you are not comfortable with your intestate heirs, um, with the state just finding the next closest relative in the event of a disaster, another option is to name a charity. And that's a conversation that we very frequently have with our clients. Finally, you are thinking about who you want to carry out this process. In the case of a will, um, your executor is the person who will take an oath before the court and will promise to carry out your will as you wished it to be carried out. And they will account to the court to show that they carried out your wishes. You may also be naming as part of your will a trustee to manage those funds that you're leaving for a loved one with conditions, such as for minor children. And again, if you have minor children, you may name a guardian. Now that guardian will still typically have to be approved by the court, but if you have listed them in your will, then the court will generally honor that appointment. As I said, I did wanna um, give a quick word on wills versus revocable trusts. And I like to think of this as hassle now or hassle later. A revocable trust is what we call a will substitute. It is going to take the place of a will and the only purpose is to avoid the probate process. A revocable trust in and of itself does not have any tax benefit unless you draft it with extra tax protections that can be included in a will or in a revocable trust. The hassle now aspect of a revocable trust refers to the fact that a revocable trust does cost more money to draft. It is typically a little bit more complicated, but most importantly, it requires you to change the name of all of your assets and the titling of all of your property into the name of the trust. If you complete that process, then when you die, the instructions in the trust um, take over and your trustee, the person that you name as the fiduciary of your trust, handles the distribution as opposed to an executor under a will. The executor and the trustee carry out the same function. The difference is that with a revocable trust, the trustee is not typically overseen by the court and they don't take an oath before the court. However, they both are fiduciaries, just like an agent is a fiduciary, as I mentioned on the prior slide, and they must act not as they wish to act or as would benefit them, 
but as you wanted. The reason that um, we often don't necessarily recommend a revocable trust is because of that process of putting all of the assets into the trust and the frequency with which we see people fail to put all of their assets into the trust. And so they have gone through the extra time and expense of establishing the revocable trust, but do not actually put their assets into the trust. Meaning that after they die, their estate still has to go through the probate process, which was the, the thing that they were seeking to avoid. If however, it's very important to you to avoid probate and you know that you will take the steps of changing the ownership of all of your assets and property into the revocable trust, then it can save your executor the process of having to go through distribution with court oversight. They can be a trustee and distribute without that oversight and they don't have to pay the, the probate fees from your estate, meaning that ultimately there's a little bit more in your estate to go to your loved ones. We're not gonna talk more about revocable trust here today, but if that is something that you are interested in and if avoiding probate is important to you, it's an important topic to bring up with your estate planning attorney. Next, we'll talk about general durable powers of attorney, which are often referred to as financial powers of attorney because they're mostly used for banking and money related decisions. They also, however, pertain to legal decisions generally. And some examples of when a general durable power of attorney would be used for making legal decisions is in the event that you were in a car accident and you wanted your agent to be able to speak with an attorney and bring a lawsuit on your behalf. Or if you are a young adult going away to college and you want you to name your parent as an agent, to speak with a college on your behalf, to handle the financial um, applications and to have access to your grades. Durable just means that it, the power of attorney lasts beyond your incapacity, that it will be effective even when you cannot make and communicate decisions for yourself. That's the, the entire reason that you want this power of attorney as part of your estate plan, or rather it's a big part of why you want this power of attorney as part of your estate plan for when there's an emergency and it's needed. The bigger question is, do you want the power of attorney to be effective before you're incapacitated? Um, and that's what this first bullet point here refers to. Is the power of attorney immediately effective upon signing or is it only effective once you are determined to be incapacitated, once you cannot make and communicate decisions for yourself? When clients tell me that they want the power of attorney to be springing, that they only want it to be effective once they're incapacitated, I bring up two considerations, one substantive and one more procedural that I think all people should think about when um, putting together a power of attorney. The first um, one that I will touch on is the substantive one. If a client says to me, I just don't trust this person, I'm not comfortable with them making decisions unless it's absolutely necessary, then I say, we might need to think about a different agent to name. Because if you don't trust them, now, how will you trust them or why should you trust them if you're in a coma? Um, so that's the first substantive consideration. Maybe we need to think about a different agent. The second is procedural. It is a greater hassle for your agent to act under a power of attorney if it's springing because they have to get a doctor's certification that you are unable to make and communicate decisions that you are incapacitated and that they may therefore act. In the event of an emergency, your agent then has to go through that extra step before they can act. This is important to some people and it is absolutely something that can be included, but I like my clients to know about that and to be understanding that that is the decision that they're making when they do a springing power of attorney. The other thing to consider is that your agent then really can only act when under those circumstances. There are situations where you may be in a car accident and you may be recuperating, but you are not incapacitated. However, you wish for your agent to start handling your bills, to speak with that attorney about a lawsuit, to, um, to work with your HOA, 
Um, for all of these reasons, you may want your power of attorney to enable your agent to act before you're incapacitated and um, procedurally they cannot um, if the springing power of attorney dictates that it's only applicable after you are certified incapacitated by a doctor. The other consideration that I like to bring up with general durable powers of attorney are what are often referred to as hot powers. So typically states have a list of powers very similar between states that have to be specifically listed in the power of attorney in order for your agent to have them. Generally speaking, under a general durable power of attorney, your agent can take any legal action that you could have taken yourself. However, they cannot take action under these hot powers unless they're specifically listed. The big ones to consider and kind of a, to give you a general idea of what hot powers are, um, are making gifts. So if you want your agent to be able to make a gift using your assets, your money, that has to be specifically included. And you can differentiate between larger gifts and smaller gifts. Make or changing a trust is a, often a hot power that needs to be included. If you wish for your agent to be able to create a trust for your child or for a loved one, then you would want to specifically include that. Changing beneficiary designations, such as on your retirement account or your life insurance account, um, life insurance policy would have to be specifically included in your power of attorney. And finally, if you want your agent to be able to access your digital assets, such as your online banking, your email account where you receive e-bills and other online accounts, that should be specifically included in your general durable power of attorney. Next, I'm gonna to speak to healthcare powers of attorney and advanced medical directives. And I'm gonna talk about both of them together However, you can often see a healthcare power of attorney and a financial power of attorney combined in one document. You may also see a healthcare power of attorney and an advanced medical directive combined in one document, or you could see all three of them separately. I'm talking about the healthcare power of attorney and advanced medical directive together because they both pertain to medical decisions. The first point to keep in mind with a healthcare power of attorney is that your agent does not have to be the same as your financial agent and cannot make decisions unless you are unable to make decisions. So I spent a good bit of time on the last slide talking about when a general durable uh, power of attorney becomes effective. A healthcare power of attorney is really only used when you are incapacitated and the doctors need to look to someone else to advise them on what decisions to make for your health. If you are in a doctor's office and they are advising you that there are two potential courses of treatment, A or B, and you bring your, your spouse with you and you wish to choose A and your spouse wishes to choose B and your spouse is your agent, your doctor will still listen to you because you have capacity and you are stating your own wishes. It's really only when they are not able to look to you for medical decisions that your agent will control. Another point to keep in mind when making medical plans for emergencies is that an advanced medical directive or living will as it's often called is only used in end stage conditions. When you are at in a, in a condition or a circumstance that is at the end of your life and the medical professionals say there is no hope of recovery. This is important to keep in mind because as people think through this, they often think about um, loved ones who've been sick for a long period of time and the kind of care that they want. And that's really not the circumstance that we're thinking of with a living will or advanced medical directive. With an advanced medical directive, we are talking about um, when you are in an end stage condition, you cannot make and communicate your wishes. What do you want to have happen? Do you want extraordinary measures used to prolong your life when you are not expected to recover? Or do you want to be permitted to die without any intervening measures? Another important consideration is that this does not impact your access to palliative care. The um, medical uh, professionals are going to try to make you comfortable 
and to, to um, use whatever tools are in their toolbox to do so. And your advanced directive, unless, unless you specifically don't want that, which is rare, is not going to impact your access to that comfort. It really is going to address extreme measures to prolong your life when you are not able to communicate for yourself and you're not expected to recover. The final piece that I wanna say about this is that while these documents are so important and we advise people to complete them and to share them with their doctors and with their family, we also encourage you to speak with your family. We rarely leave the house anticipating a catastrophic event that will require us to have our living will on hand. And so I strongly encourage all of my clients to speak with their loved ones about their wishes so that their loved ones know what they want. And if they have the living will, they can have that peace of mind of having it in writing, but they're also ready, um, armed with that conversation ahead of time. I so appreciate you tuning in with us today. If you want more information on these topics, please visit our website at www.mcandrewslaw.com where we have a number of articles on these topics as well as our questionnaires that we ask clients to review, consider, and complete to the best of their abilities before an initial consult with us so we may adequately prepare to meet your needs. In addition, our YouTube series has um, more specific on these and other estate planning documents that could be of use to you and your family. Thank you again.